Hi, this is Tony Elwick from Strategen. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is outcome-driven innovation. It's a, a basic overview of our approach that we've created over the years. We have a pretty simple philosophy about uh, innovation. We believe that it is a process, has a beginning and an end, and at a very high level, we think about it as the process of coming up with solutions that address unmet customer needs. So it's pretty simple. Uh, we're trying to take a very complex subject and make it a bit simpler to, to understand. Now, when we think about the process in this fashion, there's really two ways you can go about and execute the innovation process. Um, historically, the process begins with ideas, coming up with lots of ideas and testing them in the, mar uh, in the market or with customers, refining them to see if they'll address uh, needs in the marketplace. Now, I think most companies have come to realize that this approach is pretty inefficient and really doesn't work that well in helping them create breakthrough products and services and that they've moved towards uh, the other approach, which is to first come up with all the needs uh, that exist in the market and the unmet needs, and then create products and services that address them. So the goal here is to figure out uh, right up front, who's our customer? What is the problem they're trying to solve? Uh, is there a segment of customers that is more underserved than others? Um, along what dimensions are they underserved? What are their unmet needs? Do we need uh, brand new products? Can we add features to the current platform? Will people pay more? All these are very key questions that um, should be answered up front uh, in the innovation process. And this is you know, marketing 101, this is basic logic, uh, but it's been very difficult for companies to achieve this very basic logic and bring it into practice uh, for one key reason. Uh, I think we all agree that we're trying to create solutions that address unmet needs, but when companies sit around in a room and start debating what solutions are best to address unmet needs, there's really no agreement on what a need actually is. So the sales team comes in with their view of what the needs are, the marketing team has their own view, the development team has yet another view, and so on. And there's, uh, it's going to be extremely difficult for a company to agree on what features to put in the product if it can't agree on what a need is and what the needs are and which needs are unmet. So this is where we really want to focus. Uh, what we've done over the years is uh, define uh, the perfect need statement, if you will. We're trying to create a language around which we can communicate needs across the organization so we know exactly what characteristics a, um, a need should have and what content should be included in it and what structure and format it should have. Uh, literally creating a language around which to communicate what a need is across the organization. So that's really what outcome-driven innovation is all about. And once we have defined what a need is, you can see how it can be used to really change the way uh, companies innovate in the space, the way you uh, define needs, the way you uncover them, the way you prioritize them, and the way they're used to uh, create value propositions and formulate strategy in the marketplace. Uh, all this has been rolled into our book, uh, What Customers Want. Uh, we introduced this concept to Clay Christensen back in uh, the early 2000s, and uh, he wrote about it in his uh, book, The Innovative Solution, in 2002, citing Strategen's work, and talked about this as jobs to be done thinking. And since that time, uh, jobs to be done uh, thinking theory has really gone mainstream. What we're going to show you here is uh, how the approach uh, can impact and how the theory can impact your ability to create better products and services. It all starts with this basic concept, uh, the basic notion that people buy products and services to get a job done. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, what it means is that instead of studying products and asking customers about product improvements, we can go out and study the job the customer is trying to get done and break down that job into its component parts and understand step by step what people are trying to accomplish and then understand all the metrics they're using to uh, measure and judge value as they're going through that process. Now, those metrics that they're using, as you'll see, are what we call the customer's needs. It's a very specialized form of need statement. So let's talk about how all this comes together. The very first thing we do is we start thinking about markets a little bit differently. The way we're going to define them is not around a product uh, as it's typically done, like the LP market or the CD market or the MP3 market. These really aren't markets, of course. These are technologies that become obsolete over time. But it doesn't mean the market went away, right? There's still an underlying job that people are trying to accomplish. In this case, listen to music. So we're going to define a market as a group of people and by the job they're trying to get done. Okay, so there's two components. 
the group of people, and the job. Now, the advantage of doing this is now we can go talk to that group of people about this job they're trying to get done and get a very good understanding of, um, of how they measure success along each step of the way. Now, we start this uh, interviewing process by defining what the job is and defining what we call a job map. A job map is not a process map. It's not a customer journey map. It's not a customer experience map. Um, the, what, dis, what makes it uh, different and distinguishes it from these other types of maps, if you will, is that we're not laying out what people are doing because what they're doing is often very inefficient. Uh, and we're not talking about what solutions they use because people could use 10 different solutions to get the same job done. And what we're trying to understand is what is the underlying job they're trying to get done and what steps are people trying to go through in order to get that job done in the most efficient order. So if you think about it from that perspective, the job map is really the ideal process map. It's how customers would get the job done if they could get it done in the most efficient order. And we've written about this in the HBR piece called, um, called the Customer Centered uh, Innovation Map back in 2008 that really details this um, at a greater level. Let's suffice to say that uh, a job typically has um, a f these components. There's a definition phase where we're planning up front what we're trying to accomplish. Then we need to go gather all the inputs. We organize them, prepare them in a certain way. We confirm that everything's set. Then we actually execute the job. And while we're doing that, we're monitoring the execution, making modifications as we go, and then we conclude. Here's an example here, continuing with the music uh, uh, example, the technology where first we're assessing the situation, we gather the inputs, we organize them, we execute the job, monitor, make modifications, and conclude. Now, the reason we create the job map is because we're trying to figure out the entire job the customer's trying to get done. And this really sets the vision for the organization. Because once you know what the entire job is, the goal of your company is to work over the next days, weeks, years, decades, to help customers get the entire job done on a single platform. And what we've learned is that all markets evolve in that direction. So knowing what the entire job is really lays out the groundwork for where your company needs to go in the future. And we can see it in this example here. We see MP3s come along, they get a lot more of the job done better, and as a result, the technology gets adopted for use. You see streaming services come along, again, getting the job done significantly better, and the technology gets adopted for use. And this is the recurring theme that we see uh, over and over again in markets, that people don't want to have to cobble together lots of different solutions to get the entire job done. They want a single product from a vendor that can get the entire job done on a single platform. I love using this example here of Nespresso, uh, where you can see all these different pieces coming together, where you know, before people had to uh, go uh, get the water from one location and get uh, some electricity from another location and a heating source and heat the water and then combine the ingredients that they got from another location into the water and mix it producing the drink. Now if you were a coffee pot manufacturer you would think the job is to just heat water but as you can see here heating water is really just one step in a bigger job that the customer is trying to get done which is to prepare uh, themselves a hot beverage. So once you think of the job at at that level, at the right level of abstraction as we call it, you can see that there are other possibilities in terms of getting more of the job done better on a single platform for customers. The second key area that's uh, very different is the way we define customer needs. I like thinking about this as a hierarchy, if you will, where we have the high level job the customer is trying to get done on top, and then we have the job steps, and then underneath each, each step there are customer needs. These are the metrics they're using to measure success and value when getting the job done. Now what we've done over the years is we've literally invented a customer need statement. We've invented what we think the perfect statement should be. And I wanted to start here just by defining some of the characteristics that the perfect need statement should have. You can see on this diagram on the left here that you know companies have conversations with customers all the time and companies are trying to extract a need statement from the customer. The problem is uh, the company doesn't really know what that need statement should look like and nor does the customer. So they're both guessing at what this need should look like and what form it should be in. So one of the very key things here is that these statements have to be metrics that customers use to measure value. It's the way they define value. 
And at the same time, that statement has to be useful for the company to go create a product that addresses that need in, in the perfect sense. So it has to have this dual purpose. It's a statement that comes from customers that represents how they measure value, but it's also a statement that we can use to create value for the customer and help them get the job done better. Ideally, outcomes are stable over time. And this is the value, uh, one of the, the huge benefits of focusing on the underlying job because the job is stable over time, meaning then these outcomes can be very stable over time as well. And this is a huge advantage when you're coming up with products and services that uh, won't be introduced into the marketplace for years. Uh, and we don't want needs to be ever changing as you may currently think of them. This stabilizes them because these metrics are useful uh, year after year. The statements also have to be free from solutions and specifications. Uh, you know, we're trying to come up with solutions that address unmet needs. If we go to customers to talk about their needs and they're offering up solutions, then we still don't know the needs. And this is often a problem that I see in the industry. We also have learned that in order to get a job done better, you can only get it done faster, more predictably, and with higher output and throughput. That's it. So what that means is these outcome statements have to uh, be defined along one of those three dimensions. These outcomes also have to be cross-functionally applicable. So the sales, the marketing, development, R&D teams can all use the same set of inputs to drive value and make decisions that are important to them in their roles. And lastly, I say that these have to be research ready, meaning the next step in the process here is to take these inputs and have customers prioritize them in the marketplace. And these statements are going to go into a survey. So they have to be uh, in a format that people can rate them for importance and satisfaction to get statistically valid results. So with that, let's introduce what an outcome is. This is how the statement is defined. It has a direction of improvement, a metric that can be measured and controlled in the design of the product. There's an object of control. This is the actual outcome that people are trying to achieve. And there's a contextual clarifier to define the situation and bring context around the situation in which they're trying to achieve that particular outcome. So for any given market, what we found is that there are a hundred or more different outcomes. So there, it's not as if there's five or 10 needs in a given market or 20 to 30 for that matter. Um, most markets are pretty complex. And the goal here is to uncover all these different needs. We do this through a variety of research methods, one-on-one -on -one interviews, Skype interviews, observational research, uh, they're all useful methods in coming up with um, discovering the set of needs. And what we're trying to do here is create an uh, inventory of needs um, before we go out and quantify them. So at this point in the process, we know all the needs that exist in the market. What we don't know now are which are unmet. As we start thinking about the complete inventory of needs, we've spoken mostly about the needs on the core functional job that the customer is trying to get done. But there are other types of needs that we capture and integrate into the process as well. Uh, the second type relates to what we call consumption chain jobs, where people have to purchase the products, set them up, learn to use them, transport them, clean them, store them, and so on. Now, people aren't buying the products so they can transport them and store them, they're buying them to get this core functional job done. But we do have to improve the customer experience by making sure that all these consumption chain jobs can be executed effectively by the customer. So capturing outcomes for each of these uh, consumption chain jobs uh, is often part of the work we would do in a given market. A third input of what we call related jobs. While getting the core job done, people may want to get other jobs done. So if you can help them get multiple jobs done on a single platform, your product becomes more valuable. And you can think about the iPhone as the ultimate example here, which gets tens of thousands of jobs done on a single platform. And for each of your industries, what you want to do is to figure out you know, what are those other jobs that can be incorporated into your product platform. The next piece is emotional jobs. People want to be perceived in certain ways when they're executing their job, the core job. And they want to feel certain ways as they uh, complete the execution of the core job. So understanding what those emotional jobs are is critical, in, especially in terms of marketing the product to appeal to their emotions. And the last piece are the financial outcomes that come from the buyer. In many markets, the buyer and the customer are not the same individual. 
In fact, in many uh, markets that we contend with, like, like in the medical space, for example, uh, buyers never even use the products that, uh, that they're purchasing. But they, uh, while they can't offer us good insight into what the product should do, they can offer us insight into the financial metrics they use to decide if they want to go with product A or product B or vendor A or vendor B. So that rounds out the, the, the view of customer needs. Now what we want to do is to quantify these in a certain fashion to segment the market around unmet needs. So this is um, the, the data-driven part of our approach. We like thinking about outcome-driven innovation as a customer-centric, data-driven approach to innovation. And the first part that you've seen so far, the qualitative piece, is representative of the, the, the customer-centric uh, view of the approach. What we're going to show you now is the data-driven portion of the approach. Once we know all the customer needs, we want to quantify them with customers with a statistically valid set of customers, uh, anywhere between 180 and maybe 1,200 people, depending on the market. So we put together a survey with all these statements in them, and we're going to ask people to rate the importance of each need given, this, and, uh, given the situation, and we're going to ask them to rate the satisfaction of each outcome given the solutions that, that they're using today. So we know what solutions they're using. We ask them that and we're going to ask them how satisfied they are with each solution and its ability to get the job done along each of these 100 plus different dimensions. Now from that, we're going to plot all this information out on what we call an opportunity landscape. Here you can see the importance running along the horizontal axis and satisfaction along vertical. And that one dot there represents one outcome statement. And that one outcome gets plotted there because 81% of the population taking the survey rated that outcome a 4 or 5 for importance, yet only 30% rated it a 4 or 5 for satisfaction. So what we do is we plug that into this opportunity algorithm here, where we look at the importance plus the importance minus the satis satisfaction of the outcome. What we're saying here is, in order for this to be an opportunity for growth, the need has to be important, and then relative to that importance, it has to be unsatisfied. So what we're going to do is plot out all the different needs, the 100 plus different outcome statements that we've gathered. And pretty quickly here, we can see where the market's underserved and where the market is overserved. And if you think about innovation as uh, the, the process of coming up with solutions that get the job done better and or more cheaply, this provides you the insights to get the job done better over in the far right, where it points out the underserved needs in the purple area and more cheaply over on the far left, where it points out the overserved needs in the grace area. Now, the question we love asking here, of course, is what are the chances of your company coming up with a solution that addresses those 15 or so unmet needs if it doesn't know what those needs are? And the answer, of course, is highly unlikely, less than one in a million. But let's flip that around and say, what are the chances that your company will come up with a solution that addresses those 15 or so unmet needs if it knows exactly what those unmet needs are and they agree that those are the unmet needs. Now, this is the power of the approach because once a company has identified exactly what those unmet needs are, chances are very, very good. Uh, in fact, 86% or better, according to our, our calculations, that they're going to be able to come up with a solution that addresses those needs. Now, there's one other very important part of the approach. Uh, and this, I think, is really the most revealing uh, of everything that we've talked about so far. And that is, um, in most markets, people don't agree on what needs are important and unsatisfied. And again, this goes back to marketing 101, right? The, in nearly every market, there are segments of customers with different unmet needs. Now, what we want to do is discover those segments. We want to discover segments of customers with different unmet needs. And the way we do that is to not segment by gender or age, or region of the country, or size of the household, or business. And the reason is, by segmenting around any demographic, psychographic, attitudinal, behavioral characteristic does not produce segments of customers with different unmet needs, at least not efficiently. The most efficient way to come up with segments of customers with different unmet needs is to actually segment around unmet needs, which is exactly what we do. We begin the process by uh, putting the 100 plus different outcome statements through what we call a factor analysis. What we're doing in factor analysis is trying to figure out which outcomes explain the most variability in the example. 
in the sample. Uh, there might be some outcomes that half the market thinks is very important and unsatisfied, and the other half thinks is very unimportant and very satisfied. So we're looking for those variables in the, in the uh, sample. Then we take those variables and we use them to do the clustering analysis. The clustering analysis is run through an, like an SPSS package or something like that, uh, where we literally ask uh, the software tool to take these customers and place them into two th segments, three segments, five segments, ten segments, so we can pick the number of segments that we want to look at. And then once they're placed in those segments, we figure out why they got placed there, what their unmet needs are, what makes them different. What we've discovered in many markets is that the reason segments exist is because in some situations, customers encounter more complexities than others when getting a job done. And I'll show you this example here and explain that. In this market here, we see three different segments. So this is the entire population. You see those hundred or so dots, outcomes, represented three times in this chart. Uh, one of the segments, uh, you can see in red, 19% of the population, um, they are fairly overserved. The segment over the far right, which is 24%, is highly underserved. Now, this study comes from uh, work we did in the uh, transportation space, and we were looking at drivers who were trying to reach a destination on time. Now, we all have to reach our destinations on time, but some of us go to the same locations each day. We leave at the same time. Uh, we know the traffic patterns and backup routes. And as a result, we really don't struggle that much to reach our destination on time, as represented by that segment on the left. But others of us have to go to multiple locations throughout the day, leave at different times. We don't know the traffic patterns, the backup routes. We're not sure where to park. We don't know how long it's going to take to walk from where we park. And because we encounter all these additional complexities, we struggle more than others to get the job done. Now, we see this play out in many markets, where in some situation, people encounter more complexities, whether it's in a surgical procedure, or in brushing your teeth, or listening to music, or um, any, any scenario. Uh, there's reasons why people struggle more than others to get the job done. And what we want to do is to discover what those reasons are and then what outcomes are underserved as a result. And this is what the segmentation al allows us to reveal. Uh, we never know how this is going to turn out. We see situations like this occurring. This happened to be in a medical diagnostic study where the uh, segment over the far left, highly overserved, happened to be the lead users in the, uh, in the market. They didn't really rely on the diagnostics equipment for their uh, diagnostic decision making versus the rest of the market who were dependent on getting the correct inputs from the device in order to make an accurate diagnosis. Now, the interesting thing here, of course, is that uh, the company was focusing on that segment in the far left as their lead users to get input to create better products and services. Uh, as you might guess, they were getting misled. Again, we never know what we're going to see. There's a variety of forms that we've captured outcomes and segments. This one here is of particular interest to me. Uh, this comes from a study we did with Bosch back in the mid-2000s, helping them enter the North American circular saw market. And here, uh, we see a segment over on the far left that's very satisfied. Uh, turns out these people uh, cut uh, mostly two by fours so they don't have to make any blade height adjustments or blade angle adjustments. Uh, it doesn't really matter so much where they start their cut or end it. It doesn't have to be particularly straight. And because they don't have to make very precision cuts, they're very satisfied with the product that exists today. If we contrast that to the segment over on the far right, you see that that segment has about 14 or so unmet needs. Uh, this group of, of carpenters had to make more finished cuts or in more lengthy cuts. So they had to make more blade height adjustments, blade angle adjustments. And as a result of them encountering these additional complexities, they had certain unmet needs that the rest of the market did not have. Now, I particularly like this example because it shows the level of precision that you need to go through to discover opportunities in commodity type markets. It also shows the level of precision that outcome-driven innovation has at finding those opportunities that exist in the market. 
again, you know, asking the question, you know, what are the chances that the Bosch Circular Saw team uh, would have randomly come up with a solution that addressed those 14 unmet needs in that one segment? If it didn't know what those 14 unmet needs were, or if that segment existed, and flip it around, uh, let's ask, you know, how long did it take the Bosch engineers to come up with a solution that addressed those 14 unmet needs? And the answer was three hours. And as they put it, uh, you know, they said, we've had these ideas before, but the problem is we've had thousands of ideas before. And with the ideas database of 10,000 different ideas or more, it's really hard to select you know, which 14 are really going to have the most impact on a segment of customers in the marketplace. So again, you can see the value of the approach. What we're trying to do here is to take the guesswork out of the process by specifically answering key questions up front, such as, who's the customer and what is the job they're trying to get done and is there a segment of customers that are more underserved along what dimensions are they underserved and from there we can start formulating our strategies. There are two more interesting pieces of uh, information that we're able to gather. Uh, we've been able to figure out in the last few years um, how much more people will pay to get a job done better and from that uh, correlate that with which needs they would pay most to have satisfied. So we often find you know, our clients ask uh, not only you know, will people pay more, but specifically for, for which outcomes would they pay more if we could satisfy them. So we're able to answer that question as well. And the other uh, value of the approach is that it really lays out some uh, really interesting competitive analysis because we know what's, in the case of Bosch, what circular saws they were using to get the job done, and they rated the satisfaction of those saws along each outcome. So we could look at the strengths and weaknesses of each circular saw as it pertained to every dimension of getting the job done. It becomes very powerful. Well, once we know all this information, it's used to formulate the market strategy and the product strategy. So once we know what the unmet needs are, we can create our value proposition uh, like we did for coloplast, for example. Uh, traditional thinking was uh, in the wound care market that um, making the wound heal faster was really what um, what was the goal of the, of the customer. Well, as it turned out, 10 of the top 15 unmet needs didn't relate to making the wound heal faster. They related to making sure the wound didn't get worse. So what Coloplast did is they adopted the value proposition of we make, uh, we help prevent complications. Uh, preventing complications is the value proposition where uh, which incorporated all the unmet needs. So with that, they then targeted their existing offerings at those unmet needs. Uh, they uh, messaged accordingly. They changed the value proposition, the marketing communications, the way they communicated th um, through the sales team, and the way they qualified their leads, all helped them to achieve double-digit growth within, um, within a six-month period. And we've seen this play out in a number of uh, different situations. We just published a, uh, a nice case study uh, that's on our website uh, uh, regarding Arm & Hammer's animal nutrition uh, division, uh, which uh, increased their revenue year to year from 2013-2014 by over 30 uh, percent, applying the exact same principles that we're talking about here. And they did it without changing their product or their pricing. So this is purely a market strategy that they employed to help them generate new revenue. Of course, the approach is also used to create the product strategy and the product roadmap to take you from where you are now to eventually getting the entire job done on a single platform. And it involves whether it's borrowing features from existing products or accelerating uh, products that are in the pipeline already or co-developing, acquiring, creating new feature sets, creating new subsystems, uh, all in a very specific order to get the entire job done on a single platform. So this is the power of the approach. Uh, what we're attempting to do is to mitigate the risk of failure by spending a lot of time up front understanding the needs of the customer, figuring out specifically uh, who the customer is and what the job is and uh, what needs are unmet and what segments to target and precisely uh, you know, what uh, outcomes to uh, focus on in order to uh, execute a profit share strategy or other strategies that may win in the marketplace. So we encourage you to uh, continue to learn more about outcome-driven innovation. You can buy uh, What Customers Want on Amazon.com or visit us on our website at strategy.com to learn more.